Hello everyone, my name is Rinaldi. Thank you all for being here to watch my talk and for the PyCon APAC committee for having me here. I hope you've all been having a great time at the conference so far. Today, I'll be talking through enhancing documentations on Sphinx with the power of extensions. This is meant to be an intermediate talk to those who are already familiar with Python, but it is also instructive to pick up and apply, whatever stage of your learning and applying you are currently at at the moment with Python. So without further ado, let's jump straight into it. So firstly, before we begin, I'd like to talk about a bit of myself. I'm a project lead and developer advocate at Grace Studio, and I have a very big interest within cloud projects and within project management, as can be seen also from the certifications I've earned over time. Aside from that, I also run meetups, hackathons, do tech talks, and I'm a, VP, I'm a VR tech enthusiast. I've spoken in many conferences and events and have been active in the open source community for the past five years. So what's our agenda for today? Firstly, I'd like to motivate why we essentially have to even use Sphinx in the first place. So firstly, I'd like to pose the question on why we document in the first place and why Sphinx particularly for documentation. Afterwards, I'll be talking a bit about creating markup processors, which is essentially the skill that we need to be able to have to be able to then create meaningful extensions. Third, I'll then be talking about create current trends within developing extensions. Fourth, I'll be talking about key considerations within development of extensions. And finally, I'll be giving a bit of a case study of my own custom markup processor extension and how I've essentially used it before in order to be able to utilize it with, for my own production environment and how you can as well. So let's jump straight into the motivation first. So first and foremost, we need to understand the importance of documentation. Why even bother? Well, turns out there are actually a lot of reasons why we should think about it. Firstly, there's definitely going to always be change in personnel whenever we work at any company. Change of personnel is something that we can never anticipate, but because we want to anticipate it, we always have to essentially be sure to essentially document, 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 because when someone leaves the company, most likely the next person who comes in won't exactly know what's going on. And essentially, they'll just have to dig through all this code without any particular documentation actually in place. And essentially, it's just going to make life very inefficient in companies. And that's why people need to document what they do as part of their code. This is also a thing as well when you work with people across many different teams. Because when you work with people in many different teams, you start to essentially also see different teams' particular capabilities. And you also start to essentially feel that you actually need to be able to have one search of truth because you don't know who you're go going to be actually need to ask particularly for particular case scenarios and particular inquiries about code in general. So this is why it's very important essentially to be able to work with many people across different teams and essentially ask people for pretty clear to actually document so that there's a single sort of truth. So you don't have to scramble everywhere to actually find the particular code that you have, source of code or source of truth that you actually need as part of the code. Finally, it's also in general just a form of politeness and respect to the next developer. You don't want them to just, you know, have to ask every time you actually, they actually need something from you, right? So it's just a form of politeness in general. Just to say that, yeah, I've documented this so that the next person can pretty much have a better life that way. So what types of different documentations are there? There are four different main types of documentations. And these are tutorials, how-tos, explanations, and reference guides. Throughout your career, I'm pretty sure that most of you probably would have already came across all of this. And probably some of the Differences might be a bit slight, but they are actually quite clear as well. Tutorials mainly focus essentially showing you, particularly like walking you through something essentially, and giving you kind of like a look into how it's done from step by step. How-tos are similar to that, but essentially they focus more on the actions particularly that you have to take and are more focused essentially on getting you from point A to point B. Explanations focus more on essentially more of an expository on a particular thing, essentially. So 
more or less explaining on how something is done rather than kind of like more a, a more thorough step by step thing as tutorials and how tos essentially try to uh, focus to do. And finally, reference guides, which essentially are more or less kind of like a guide to be able to bring you through a particular item, essentially. And so that you can always reference as well that way. And why Sphinx particularly for all of this? Now, as you can see, there are a lot of reasons that we actually need to consider it. These are only eight of a lot of reasons why we particularly need to use Sphinx. But a couple of the reasons start off is actually written because they are written essentially as plain text files, which is very important, essentially, as plain text files are very easy to essentially convert from one place to another and be used in like different places. And alongside this, many different layouts can also be used. It makes it essentially customizable this way and not only conform to a particular layout. Going down to the other reasons as well, it's also possible to auto-generate documentation based on source code which is actually not a thing that a lot of extensions can do and not a lot of documentation tools can do. So this is very important, essentially. Developers can also focus on the content layout and the output particularly provided by Sphinx. And they can focus on this particularly rather than the actual nitty gritty stuff that usually is brought up by essentially using these kinds of tools. So essentially, it makes things definitely a bit easier that it provides cross-references to different parts of the documentation, and it also provides version control with GitHub. This essentially makes it up-to-date with the latest modern practices that we currently have with maintaining code, which makes it very important. And I'll elaborate a bit more on that as well, on essentially using this as part of modern practices uh, within my case study particularly. Documentation part is essentially also, can also be part essentially of the source code repo. So you can essentially use this as part of like the repo as well, not only particularly used locally, but so that it can essentially be shared within different people who actually access the repo as well. And finally, you can also catch errors as part of the Sphinx build uh, command. And I'll talk about that a bit more, but essentially Sphinx build is pretty much like what command you use particularly to build the documentation. And you can actually also capture it on standard error or like standard out essentially as part of this. So as part of this, you can essentially log out the particular errors that you have to be able to debug it easily. And there are also many different ways of like essentially like going about catching errors, but this is just like one of them, which is a very effective way. So within the hierarchy of documentations, usually as can be seen over here, the docs usually sits right within the root essentially. And so for example, you have a folder containing functions, the docs usually just sits within the root essentially, so that you're able to essentially access documentation that essentially points to different parts of the folder. Now, there could be different hierarchies that can be used particularly as part of this, but this is a very common particular hierarchy that is used a lot. And this is one example particularly. So within build phases, there are actually different kind of like phases that are often undergone when essentially working with extension mechanisms. So within how a Sphinx project is built, it's usually worked, uh, it's usually worked within five different phases. So the first phase is phase zero, which is initialization. Within this phase, nothing really interesting actually happens because the source directory is basically searching for the source files and the extensions are initialized at this particular step. If a stored built environment exists, then it is loaded. If not, then a new one is created. Within phase one, however, the source files then are read and parsed. This is particularly where directives and roles are essentially encountered by doc utils and the corresponding functions are essentially called as part of this. As part of this, the phase will output a doc tree for each of the source files, which which actually is tree for docutils nodes. For document elements, however, that are not fully known, all existing files are read, and temporary nodes will then be created. In phase two, consistency checks are done. Essentially, 
just some checking to be done to ensure that there are actually no surprise vertically within the build documents. In phase three, the metadata and the cross-reference data, uh, since they are actually all known now as part of the existing documents, all the temporary nodes are then replaced by nodes that can then be converted into output, and hence resolving the particular elements that are part of this. At phase four, which is the writing phase, the resolved doc trees are essentially converted to desired output format, for example, HTML or LaTeX. And as part of this, it happens via some a so-called doc utils writer, essentially, that visits the individual nodes of the, each particular doc tree and produces some output in the process. So when we create markup extensions via Sphinx, there are three different kinds of things that we need to consider and three different elements, essentially. So firstly, nodes. Nodes form the topmost levels of the object descriptions, particularly. And this includes a common list of object signatures and a common description of them. Directives handle, are handled by classes derived from docutils.parsers.rsd.directive, and they're particularly generic blocks of explicit markup which is particularly used as primary extension mechanisms. Event handlers, well, as the name suggests, pretty much handle events, and they are passed as through as part of the extension. So when an event comes particularly as part of the extension, it essentially is usually handled within these handlers, and different ways of handling them are usually specified. So, Let's get into a bit of the code and a bit of the samples, essentially, of a, a particular simple extension. So firstly, we need to basically set up a particular extension, essentially. And to, for this, we usually need to create a set of function. So as part of this, we want to create a new Python model, for example, in this particular case scenario called custom node. And as part of this, we add a set of function. Within this function, we actually refer to a few things that particularly as can be seen over here. And you can actually see some particular things that actually are also used particularly within, for example, Sphinx. And I'll just essentially talk through a few of them. For example, add config value in this essentially brings Sphinx to actually realize that it should recognize the new config value. And we have specified the config value over there as can be seen, which is custom node include custom nodes. And as part of this, we then also add directive and add nodes. So when we add nodes, we particularly add a new node class to the build system. And within add directive, we then essentially create and add a new directive given by the particular name and class that we specified. And this will be a bit more clear as we go on to the next slides as well, because we then also declare a particular node and a particular directive essentially as part of this. So I'm going to be skipping node for this time around because I essentially want to put a lot of focus in, essentially into directives just because nodes are generally more straightforward to essentially declare, but directives are usually a bit trickier and I want to focus a bit more on this essentially, but essentially for directives, these are essentially classes that are particularly derived from a uh, model called docutils.parsers.rsd.directive. And what we, what we really are doing here, essentially, is that we're currently just basically declaring a particular uh, new function uh, as particular directives, essentially. So as can be seen over here, uh, a lot is happening, but some things to highlight essentially from this is that we create a particular run function, which essentially specifies a particular target ID and target node. And as part of this, we then create a make admon we then call make admonition essentially to be able to target these particular functions. So as part of this, we then also append the what we have essentially the, the new particular node that we currently already have, custom node, all custom nodes, uh, as part of the, the list basically, to be able to append it and essentially with the particular doc name um, essentially, um, and also what we currently already have and making it into essentially a deep copy. So kind of like more or less like a specification, uh, a targeted kind of like um, appending based on the specifications that are currently posed. And we then particularly move on to essentially making an event handler particularly. 
As mentioned, event handlers regularly handle particular events. And because we already stored information from the source files from the environment, which actually are persistent, it may actually come become out of date when the source file changes. Now, because of this, we particularly want to essentially have records of it, and we want to be able to clear records of the old ones. And doing env.env-purge-doc, uh, which is part of essentially what we're currently doing here as well, and why we're essentially actually creating a function for purging particular documents, we essentially want to be able to um, give an extension essentially a chance to be able to clear all the our outdated documentation essentially and essentially put in new ones as soon as essentially it's updated. So as part of this, they're then updated again during um, when they essentially they're parsed again essentially as part of the documentation when it is actually um, built and it's when, when we essentially update our documentation as well. So as we can we see, this is all a, a thorough process essentially. So we essentially have a setup class, we have a directive class, we then also like declared in nodes as well as part of this, uh, which is essentially our part of the documentation. And we then also handle events as well that come along. And there can definitely be more event handlers, but this is just like one of them essentially to uh, specify as part of this. And this is also just a slide to show also how we process custom nodes as well, particularly. As, as mentioned before, um, custom nodes are generally processed particularly uh, just due to essentially uh, being able to go through the particular nodes that we've already declared and particularly just traversing them based on what we currently already have. So in this particular case scenario, we're basically just saying, for example, how uh, finding particularly how different entries are particularly located in different locations and how what lines essentially where are they located at and where they can be found. So through this, essentially, we can essentially tr traverse and track different entries and also find out the different paths in which they are located at. So how do you plan and structure extension particularly? In this particular case scenario, um, we actually utilize um, kind of like a more of a best practice thing. So as can be mentioned before, for example, we have a particular uh, repository called uh, custom X dot, dot master stands for custom extension dot, uh, slash dash master. We pretty much essentially structure it in such a way as can be seen over here. So we essentially have the Sphinx build root, the repository root, and the documentation root. So there are three different routes pretty much as part of this, but what we really want to get out of this pretty much is basically just kind of like understanding how documentations and where they essentially lie as part of the whole structure of the particular uh, repository and like the particular folder. So as can be seen, documentations always pretty much like sit within uh, the, the root of the folder, but essentially as can be seen, they have also the different um, folder elements as well as part of them. So we have the build file essentially, we have the make.bat file, we have the make file and the source. So all of this essentially is part of the, how essentially these documents are built. And aside from that, we may also have the standard other document other documents and files as well as part of that, such as license, readme, and requirements. But essentially, the one we're really focusing on is really just understanding and seeing what a potential documentation and extension looks like, essentially as part of the particular documentation file. And it would definitely lie within the uh, documentation route, as can be seen over here, when we actually make them. And they're built like through essentially make files as well. And I'd like to also talk a little bit of accessibility now. As part of this, we firstly set a language particularly within conf.py because we can actually specify a particular language that we actually want to set as part of this. So for example, if we want to set it to English or we want to set it to French, we can set it there essentially. Aside from that, we then, aside from that, it's also important to realize that um, a one on y standard in um, writing for general population is also we need to adhere to this based on those standards because these are usually really based on best practices. And if we want to refer to a particular kind of scenario, we usually refer to them essentially. And also understand that based on these standards, we can essentially tweak different things like um, and essentially make it more 
cater towards particular audiences. For example, if we want to make it more um, based on more user friendly for essentially people who may essentially have um, a bit of a more lacking eyesight, we can essentially tailor it based on that. Because it's important that when we essentially make these particular new documentations that we are actually always inclusive. And this is especially important where actions need to be taken, for example, such as when we actually need to like click on links, for example, like how do you document that? Now, a lot of that is really based on the AWS-A101Y standards. I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's something that definitely has to be explored more as well and in your time as well, because I can definitely make a new, like a whole new topic based on that, but it's um, definitely a big area and a lot of companies, a lot of um, people currently working on it are definitely like really focusing on that. So it's very important to essentially look based on that. So a bit of a case study as well for modern practice that um, I've currently also undergone as well. So this is a bit about uh, what I've done before, particularly to implement an extension for a custom class, particularly iterating over an SQL file. So as part of this, I need to actually also serve it on a, on a cloud. And I need to be able to derive benefits based on people who actually refer to it. So it's a bit of a different challenge because you probably already heard a lot, of, a lot of things, for example, about documentations. Like Usually it's like local and usually it's quite um, just the thing that you usually refer to. But serving on the cloud and essentially deriving benefits from it, that's definitely a bit, a bit of an interesting challenge. But that's also where we can actually see where this truly shines because, well, we can truly see how essentially people are using it in modern practice to this way. And so what I did pretty clearly for this kind of case scenario and what was actually best practices and recommended by a lot of people as well is actually, firstly, uh, for example, because I want to particularly serve my um, documentation based on uh, best practices and based on S3 bucket, I then firstly set up an IP restricted S3 bucket and essentially confirm particular policy if it exists to be able to uh, restrict uh, IP restricted bucket. And if it didn't, then I particularly pretty much like a defined uh, particular policy document if it didn't. And just to be clear, this is um, AWS bucket essentially. So it's an AWS S3 bucket. And essentially as part of this, uh, we actually also then set up documentation built uh, by synchronizing the content of the local folder with the remote bucket currently on AWS. And finally, uh, we then configure S3 and operate um, it, for example, as a website. Uh, within the, with the documentation particularly in, included within it. So as can be seen with this, um, it, it's definitely an interesting way to essentially say that sometimes we need to deal with this, and especially because sometimes we don't want documentation to essentially be available to the public as well, and that's why we also have to take the necessary precautions. But this also just shows as well that even for like modern practices, it's definitely still very valid, especially since even if we're moving to the cloud and such, there's definitely always ways to implement and always ways to essentially make use of it. And this is one particular way of like how I particularly had to use this particularly when I actually made, uh, had to document stuff on my website and distribute as part of that. So what le lessons did I learn particularly from this and what lessons can we take from it? Small pieces of documentation can go a long way. There's definitely a lot that can still be done with documentation. And as part of this, we need to be able also to understand to be able to how to customize the content towards our uh, who essentially are reading it. Are we, cust are we bringing this to people who are already used to technology? Are we bringing this to people who are, for example, execs who may, uh, or people who are involved in executive management who may not exactly know the nitty gritty details about the code? Who are we giving this to? That's definitely a very important consideration. And Sphinx usually does allow to tailor it to different people as well because we essentially are able to make it definitely, you know, a, a bit easier this way or like we can tailor it to be uh, more catered towards a particular audience. And that's why I also mentioned inclusivity, inclusivity is a very important thing because we need to be able to make it available to everyone, essentially, because documentation is meant for everyone. And aside from that, we also need to look for, continue to look for ways to modernize implementation as well. And that's why I also invite the community uh, the bigger Sphinx community and the bigger Python community to also like look forward to as well, to look forward to ways to essentially modernize our particular limitations and how we can make the most out of our Sphinx limitations. Because I'm actually more uh, very keen as well to see how this goes towards the future and to see more and more implementations that people use as far as the Sphinx documentations. So the conclusion is always work with your fellow developers 
make sure that you always document, 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 because it's very important that you do this not only for yourself, not only for the next developer, but in general for everyone in general, because it's just a sign of politeness as well, but also in general, just to make life a bit easier for the next people after you. Aside from that, learn from best practices. The, the Sphinx community is a very active community, and the Python community is also a very active community as well. So just learn from, definitely from best practice, because a lot of people document different things. Do some research on your own as well, pretty much. And finally, document, 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 as I mentioned before. Just do it, really. It's definitely not that hard to pick up Sphinx, and in general, not hard to document documentations. So, And like I said before, it definitely helps a lot of people. And if you're able to do it based on best practices, like basically set a particular standard for your particular, for example, if you're working in a particular company, just like set, set a good standard for like the company pretty much. Just encourage good, be a good developer pretty much and be a good, uh, be a person who can essentially set the standard as well for documentations. Because if there's a unified standard for documentations, then that definitely can essentially be a good culture for a company. And as part of this, also in general, create a lot of new, uh, a good, very good culture and a very good um well, probably best practice essentially for the rest of the company to follow through as well. And just to close off, um, just a funny quote I essentially came across as well. So three of the biggest software lies. The program is fully tested and bug-free. We're working on a documentation, and of course we can modify it. So this just shows like how documentation is really lacking within our field, and that's why we also need to do our best essentially to also really move up on the field and really just champion best practices on documentation and just make sure that it's done well. And I believe that, I mean, I truly believe that with Sphinx, we can essentially make a forward step, uh, like make a step forward in doing that and really champion the best practice to bring it to our company. So let's do it together and let's essentially champion this best practice and bring it as a truly new change. And if it's a new change, of course, and truly just champion these best practices as part of the our own ventures. So that's all for me. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at my email or my socials that I listed down there. And I'm happy to also take any post-event questions as well. Thank you.